Welcome to the Good News Ride Home. I'm Jackson Bird. Los Angeles is considering extending their lockdown for three more months. Meanwhile, other places around the world begin reopening. A practical guide to avoiding COVID-19 risks. What the loss of smell and other neurological symptoms might mean for the relationship between coronavirus and the nervous system. Plus, a new online simulator from SpaceX, how to make cold brew in a French press, a comet to look out for tonight, and Guy Fieri and Bill Murray go head-to-head. Los Angeles County has announced it's likely to extend lockdown orders for three more months. Broadway will stay closed at least until Labor Day, and as the virus ramps up even in locations that were originally being spared, it's now been reported that every country in Africa has confirmed cases of coronavirus. Following up on the trend we mentioned yesterday of nations that have experimented with reopening now experiencing upticks in cases, quoting the Washington Post, Lebanon on Tuesday became the latest country to reimpose restrictions after experiencing a surge of infections almost exactly two weeks after it appeared to have contained the spread of the virus and began easing up. Authorities ordered a four-day near-complete lockdown to allow officials time to assess the rise in numbers, end quote. Iran will be opening schools this week even as they reimpose a lockdown in the southwestern province of Khuzestan after cases spiked there. Saudi Arabia is instituting a 24-hour lockdown for the five-day holiday marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan after seeing a spike in cases. France has banned drinking alcohol along the canals after many people took to the streets following a loosening of lockdown measures. Wu Junyo, chief epidemiologist of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, said of the new cluster of cases in Wuhan that it's now clear, quote, the course of disease could last 30 to 50 days for some patients, end quote, meaning our benchmark timeline of just 14 days might not be effective enough. But Wu had words of assurance, at least for places that had as stringent lockdown measures as Wuhan did, quote, there will not be a new minor peak. We've had the epidemic under control after more than three months of efforts and accumulated considerable experience in both diagnosis and epidemic notification. Therefore, we will not allow scattered cases to develop into massive outbreaks, end quote. But here in the United States, we have not successfully implemented as many of the testing and tracing measures we need in order to reopen. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, and Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, warn that there could be dire consequences if we attempt to reopen without sufficient testing and tracing in place. Fauci said in a remote Senate testimony yesterday, quote, there is a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak that you may not be able to control. He further said that reopening too quickly could, quote, lead to some suffering and death that could be avoided. California State University, the nation's largest four-year public university system, announced they will not be holding any in-person classes in the fall at any of their 23 campuses. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey told employees yesterday that they never have to return to working in offices if they don't want to, while Facebook and Google have both extended work-from-home policies through the end of 2020. And if you go out to eat in Washington state once restaurants reopen, you'll have to give the establishment your name, email, phone number, and have your arrival time logged if you want table service. All of this is meant to facilitate possible contact tracing should the need arise. Governor Jay Inslee did say that they're making privacy a priority in this endeavor and that restaurants would not be allowed to use this data for purposes other than contact tracing. So as many places are beginning to reopen, what can we do to stay safe? Immunologist and biologist Dr. Aaron Bromage from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth has a great blog post that's been making the rounds called A Practical Guide to COVID-19 Risks and How to Avoid Them. It is definitely worth a read in full, but here are a few takeaways. First, he shares one of the easiest to understand ways you can get infected that I have personally heard yet. Quote, In order to get infected, you need to get exposed to an infectious dose of the virus. 
Based on infectious dose studies with other coronaviruses, it appears that only small doses may be needed for infection to take hold. Some experts estimate that as few as 1,000 SARS-CoV-2 infectious viral particles are all that will be needed. Infection could occur through 1,000 infectious viral particles you receive in one breath or from one eye rub, or 100 viral particles inhaled with each breath over 10 breaths, or 10 viral particles with 100 breaths. Each of these situations can lead to an infection, end quote. And so breaking that down practically, quoting again, a single cough releases about 3,000 droplets, and droplets travel at 50 miles an hour. Most droplets are large and fall quickly, gravity, but many do stay in the air and can travel across a room in a few seconds. A single sneeze releases about 30,000 droplets, with droplets traveling up to 200 miles an hour. Most droplets are small and travel great distances, or easily across a room. If a person is infected, the droplets in a single cough or sneeze may contain as many as 200 million virus particles, which can all be dispersed into the environment around them. A single breath releases 50 to 500 droplets. Most of these droplets are low velocity and fall to the ground quickly. There are even fewer droplets released through nose breathing. End quote. To determine your risk in various situations, consider those exposure numbers and then multiply by the time that you spend in certain environments. For example, quote, speaking increases the release of respiratory droplets about tenfold, about 200 virus particles per minute. Again, assuming every virus is inhaled, it would take five minutes of speaking face to face to receive the required dose, end quote. All right, so knowing all of that, where are the most dangerous places that we could be going right now? Because of the formula of exposure times time spent, indoor spaces are much more dangerous than outdoors. In fact, the home, workplace, public transport, social gatherings, and restaurants account for 90% of all transmission events. Meanwhile, things with brief exposure, such as shopping, account for a relatively small proportion of cases, and only one single outbreak in places that have been doing contact tracing has been reported from an outdoor environment. Even being dozens of feet apart from an infected person in a closed space doesn't really matter if you're there for hours. The six-feet social distancing rule, though, is still helpful for brief encounters and the outdoors, where wind and space dilute and reduce viral load. Quoting again, When assessing the risk of infection via respiration at the grocery store or mall, you need to consider the volume of the airspace, in this case very large, the number of people, restricted, how long people are spending in the store, workers all day, customers an hour. Taken together, for a person shopping, the low density, high air volume of the store, along with the restricted time you spend in the store, means that the opportunity to receive an infectious dose is low. But for the store worker, the extended time they spend in the store provides a greater opportunity to receive the infectious dose and therefore the job becomes more risky. If you're sitting in a well-ventilated space with few people, the risk is low. If I'm outside and I walk past someone, remember it's dose and time needed for infection. You would have to be in their airstream for five plus minutes for a chance of infection. While joggers may be releasing more virus due to deep breathing, remember the exposure time is also less due to their speed. End quote. And a note, of course, that none of this addresses surfaces you might be touching in any of these situations, so bear that in mind and, of course, wash your hands. As Jason Kotke in his summary of the article concluded, the Michael Pollan version of advice for socializing during the pandemic might be spend time with people, not too much, mostly masked, and outdoors. In a lot of the first-person COVID-19 patient accounts that we've shared on this show, people have mentioned a loss of taste and smell, usually without the nasal congestion that comes with the common cold, as one of the first signs that they had the disease. While it was debated by experts for a while, the CDC recently added the loss of smell, or anosmia, to its official list of symptoms. Anosmia might not just be a sign that you're getting COVID-19, however, it could also be an indication that the virus has widespread effects on the nervous system. 
Quoting Knowable magazine, physicians around the world have documented neurological symptoms in a significant fraction of COVID-19 patients. Some patients have experienced headaches, dizziness, and other relatively minor symptoms, while others have had more serious problems like confusion and impaired movement and even seizures and strokes. Nobody knows at this point how widespread neurological symptoms are, nor the extent to which they contribute to the overall clinical picture for COVID-19. Another huge unknown is whether SARS-CoV-2 can attack the nervous system directly by infecting neurons, as rabies and a number of other viruses do, or cause neurological symptoms indirectly by triggering rampant inflammation or blood clotting, end quote. For some patients, neurological symptoms are the earliest sign of the disease. For others, they're the only symptom. And for yet others, they're the lingering symptoms after all others have passed. Figuring out the unknowns about COVID-related anosmia could help us figure out how the disease progresses. Carol Yan, a rhinologist at the University of California, San Diego, was a part of the first peer-reviewed study on the subject. Yan says that the presence of anosmia was mostly confined to patients with mild or no other symptoms. One explanation, she says, could be that in mild cases, the virus stays confined to the nasal cavity, while in more severe cases, it spreads to the lungs. As for the other documented neurological symptoms like headaches, dizziness, confusion, and stroke, the role that the virus plays is uncertain. Many of the patients with these symptoms have experienced low oxygen and may have pre-existing conditions that could cause the symptoms, and while there were only scattered reports of such symptoms in SARS and MERS, there were less people overall who had SARS and MERS, so it could just be a case of more documentation now, not a higher proportion of patients with these symptoms. However, some researchers are hypothesizing that the virus could be invading the nervous system and suppressing the respiratory centers in the brain, which then exacerbates breathing problems. There's no evidence for this yet, but some scientists are considering it. Pierre Talbot, a virologist at the Armand Frappier Santé Biotechnology Research Center near Montreal, has long argued that coronaviruses can work in the other direction. In studying a human coronavirus called OC43, as well as SARS and MERS in mice, his team has found that the viruses can, quote, infect olfactory neurons and travel along their axons to the brain's olfactory bulb. From there, the viruses spread quickly throughout the brain, end quote. While his team is planning on running similar experiments on SARS-CoV-2, he stresses that what happens in mice does not guarantee what will happen in humans in real-world scenarios, and that this new virus may very well act differently. A final hypothesis is that some neurological symptoms are caused by the infamous cytokine storm, when your body's immune system goes into overdrive, which can cause long-term effects after other symptoms subside. There are a lot of questions yet to be explored here, but for now, some ear, nose, and throat specialists are calling for the loss of taste and smell to be an early screening test for COVID-19 and that people experiencing those symptoms self-isolate. It's also important to note that most people who experience anosmia do regain their sense of smell within a few weeks. And now switching over to some good news. Ahead of their first crewed mission on May 27th, SpaceX has released a new online simulator in which you can try to dock their Crew Dragon spacecraft at the International Space Station. And it is pretty difficult to play. Quoting The Verge, The simulator begins with your Crew Dragon vehicle radically askew in space. Ahead, a virtual recreation of the International Space Station awaits, but the docking system on your Crew Dragon is pointed at an angle away from the port with which it needs to align. Luckily, there are plenty of controls to fix the vehicle's position and approach the station, but remember, in space, it's not as simple as moving forward, backward, or turning. You've got six degrees of freedom, so you also need to be pitched properly and roll the vehicle to its right orientation." End quote. The key, as the simulator tells you on the home screen, is patience. You have to move slowly, and the tiniest movements have big impacts. Though I'm sure they'd be way better at it than us lay people, fortunately, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley won't have to manually dock the Crew Dragon on the International Space Station later this month because it's designed to automatically do so, though they are trained on how to do it just in case the automation fails. But if you want some real space in your life today, or if, like me, the idea of going into space even via a simulator totally freaks you out so you'd rather view it with your feet planted firmly on the ground, watch out for Comet Swan, which is making its closest pass by Earth tonight. 
comets are always pretty tough to see for the casual observer, and this one will most likely be visible in the southern hemisphere and southern parts of the northern hemisphere. You might catch it in mid-latitudes of the north just before dawn, especially if you have binoculars or a telescope. But a fun fact about Comet Swan is that it was actually discovered in part thanks to the pandemic. Michael Matiazzo, an amateur astronomer in Australia, had more downtime from his job as a pathologist because of the pandemic and was scanning images from the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory when he found a spot of light no one else had noticed before, from a photo taken by the observatory's spacecraft camera. Subsequent observations confirmed that it was indeed a comet, and it was named after the camera on the observatory spacecraft, the Solar Wind and Isotropies, or SWAN. If the closure of coffee shops and lack of commutes are making you miss your fancy coffee habit, Lifehacker has a, well, life hack on how to easily make cold brew using your French press. The writer Claire Lauer warns this is not necessarily a method for anyone with super particular coffee taste, but rather for people who miss their cafe bought cold brew and want a simple way to make it at home. Enter the unorthodox use of the French press. First, measure out a quarter cup of whole coffee beans per whole cup of water, grind the beans, combine with the water, and let sit for 12 to 24 hours in the French press with the lid on but plunger up either in the fridge or out at room temperature. You can play with the coffee to water ratio as long as how long you're leaving it to steep based on how strong you want your brew to be. Once you're done steeping, press the plunger down and then pour the coffee over ice. And if you want to level up, use frozen coffee cubes so you don't dilute the cold brew with regular ice cubes. You can also use coconut water instead of regular water for the steeping process to give the cold brew added body and flavor, giving you that fancy kick so you can pretend you're actually at your favorite coffee shop. Or you can be a total heathen like me and just pour your leftover hot coffee every morning into a growler you keep in the fridge and enjoy chilled coffee whenever you want with zero added effort. I know, I know, I'm a monster. And finally today, are you ready to go to Flavortown? This Friday, Guy Fieri and Bill Murray are going live on the Food Network's Facebook page in a nacho-making tournament for the ages. Nacho Average Showdown will feature Murray and Fieri along with their sons, who will all be judged by Terry Crews and Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. Food Network really stacked the deck on this one. And it's all for a good cause. The event will be raising money for the Restaurant Employee Relief Fund. The Relief Fund was created by Fieri in partnership with the National Restaurant Association Educational Foundation and will allow restaurant workers to get one-time $500 checks to help with living expenses. And the fund has already raised over $22 million. Now, while Guy Fieri obviously has a more culinary edge than Bill Murray, Murray's son, who will be competing with him, is an accomplished chef and owner of the 21 Greenpoint restaurant in Brooklyn. So there might actually be some interesting competition on the recipe side of things, in addition to exactly the kind of chaotic quarantine energy that we all need right now. So if you want to tune in for the good cause, or frankly, just to see what's going to happen, it's this Friday at 5 Eastern. Link to more info is in the show notes. That's all for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird. I hope you have a good day. I'll talk to you tomorrow.